Praise God. Happy Sabbath to you. It is a delight to be together again this Sabbath day. I, uh, <clears throat> I come zipping back and forth from the adoration in the park, and I'm usually sweaty enough that I change shirts and do that sort of thing, and that sometimes gives me just enough time to pull up a live stream app on my phone and just see how you're doing. So I saw you greeting one another in the chat there, and, and what a delight. Uh, I almost sent you a message, uh, but was just uh, moving a little too quickly. So glad that you are here worshiping together as we continue our summer revival series today, Grow, Grow. I'd like to invite you to turn, if you don't mind, to Mark and chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, if you don't mind as we make our way through our revival series topic today, grow, turn to Mark chapter 4. As you do, let me ask you a quick question at home. Uh, how many of you are into gardening? Throw your hand way up, get crazy in your house if you really like to. Out of those that are here, are you guys, anybody here into gardening? Uh, anybody? I see one. Yeah? What do you like to grow? Stuff to make salsa. I'm going to guess that could include tomatoes, that could include possibly jalapeno peppers. It could include, do you grow cilantro? Try to. Try to, okay. Uh, I will tell you. So Amy uh, Wickham, our brand new office manager God has given to us as a gift, is standing right over here, got a message one of the days of this week from Amy saying, hey, box of stuff from one of the church members for you, Pastor Dave. I put it in the refrigerator. I didn't know what it was, but my wife and I were going out on errands from having worked from home that particular day, and so I rushed on out, uh, and on our way, we stopped by the church, went in, looked in the little refrigerator, and there was a box, and it had been very carefully put together. It was packaged just right with uh, a uh, decorative uh, insert in the box. I'm not going to out you, uh, the, the family that gave this to us, not because it wasn't fantastic, but just because others might start expecting something from you. I just want to say that as I looked in there, oh, oh my goodness. Homegrown tomatoes, both red and yellow tomatoes. The, those yellow ones, man, they were so fantastic. And cucumbers, and I'm trying to remember what the third, gr beans, green beans and beans, different colors actually of beans. I'm going to tell you that, uh, that box of vegetables were pretty much sacrificed that very night. Uh, I love making my own kind of homemade gazpacho mix, and I'll do it pretty much any time of year, but, I, you know, tomatoes, that's a big part of it. Cucumbers, I like cucumbers in it. I like to throw in a little olive oil and maybe some balsamic vinegar and some, uh, maybe, if the, if, if the setting's just right, a little bit of mozzarella, yeah. Uh, and, and my wife has a basil plant on the back porch. Lovely, lovely stuff. You know, you can go buy the tomatoes from the store right about now, but they're nothing like these homegrown tomatoes were. I don't know what your favorite thing is to grow. Uh, Jim, do you grow anything? Uh, that's starting to sound a lot like no. <laughs> Facial hair. Yeah, that's a whole other category. Thank you for that, Jim. In the garden uh, competition, that will not win anything. Uh, but I try on occasion, I do, don't do all that great. I wonder at home, is there anybody here who tries to go, go, just go for it and grow corn, sweet corn. My wife will pull over at the side of the road, drop of hat, a little roadside sweet corn, little pop-up stand. My son will even on occasion just get a ear of sweet corn uncooked and just if it's, if it's sweet enough, he'll just go for it. That's a little harder to grow. You need a little more space and, you know, all of that. I've got to admit, my father has a green thumb. I'm not so certain I'm, uh, I'm great at growing something. feels like I'm perfectly suited in my makeup to kind of kill a garden. But if you were to ask the question, what is God's favorite thing to grow, the answer is you. The answer is me. This God of ours is not only about salvation and rescue. He's about giving us the best possible life we could have, and that is about growth. 
So what do we do? What, what, how does this work? Where do we go? We've heard from this Jesus who would span the distance and the divide between us and our sin and his righteousness and who he is coming to the cross and saving us. But what happens as a little book by N.T. Wright says, after you believe. That's what we're going to talk about today. Is it only about just proclaiming the name of Jesus and then coast? Is it all about actually building your Christian checklist of do's and don'ts and rules and kind of firing off on that and seeing how the math stacks up and yeah, can I, am I going to be saved or not? What is God's word going to tell us today? If you turned to Mark chapter 4, you're going to notice these verses starting in the 26th verse part way in. Jesus is saying this. That's why it's in quotes. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seeds on the ground. This is what the kingdom of God is like. It's a, it's a guy who who's a farmer. It's, it's a guy who has a garden. That's a good metaphor for the kingdom. And night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, and though he does not know even how, what Jesus is saying is, look, you know that we, we can have all kinds of bright thoughts about farming and best practice and all of that, but what happens from inside the seed, that's a God thing that's going on. And this is my plan for you, Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is like this. You've given your heart to me, now I'm working on growing you, and you're not even going to always understand how that even works. Like he said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, the wind blows, we don't even know where, how that's working, but we can feel it. And God causes you to grow and you can feel it all by itself, seemingly. The soil produces grain, first the stalk, and then the head, then the full kernel in the head, so that as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And I, I'm wondering if Jesus would say to us right now, you may have thought that this whole thing I'm up to is simply about rescuing you so that you live more days. No, 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 no. I've come that you live life to the fullest, and that fullest life is full ear of corn life. It's full growth life. There's, there's more I have intended for you, and it fits in part under this little word, grow. So let's pray about it. Let's dialogue about it. Let's dig into some of God's word about it. Let's seek God, face to face, Lord, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for promising salvation and grace and forgiveness and all those things that snap into full birth in us at our conversion, at our salvation, at our giving our heart to you. But Lord God, then what? Is that it? Is there more? Do we need to earn our place to stay with you? Is it just about being as, you know, good as we'd naturally otherwise be? Or do you have something even more? Grow us today as you revive us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, I don't know what kind of uh, history you have to your spirituality, what the journey of your understanding of Christ is. We, we are, are very clear that salvation comes by grace through no work of your own. It's a gift of God. Okay, I'm in. So now what? Now what? Of course, you know the Hebrews, and sometimes our own faith community has behaved much like this. The Hebrews built a long, long list of do's and don'ts and how you did it. Not just do's and don'ts, but how far, how much, where you wrap it, what you say on it, how you observe it. I mean, just to the T. Rule following as a form of pleasing God. Rule following, sacrifice making. And for some of us, that's our version of Christianity. We can buy that the grace of God saves us, but then we need, to, we need to do our part. We need to earn this thing. That on one end of the spectrum, we have to kind of realize, look, if you and I turn our spiritual life into a rule following interaction with God, we become, on some, in some way, we become puppets. And I want to suggest to you that the pro some of the problems that come with a rule-following form of religion is that sooner or later you encounter something you don't know any rule for. 
Now what? Works fine. People tell me I shouldn't go to a movie, so I don't go to a movie. I understand what a movie is in a movie theater. I understand what those locations are. You can figure that out. Okay, great. Time passes. Now the problem is that the movie can come to me. What happens now? It doesn't have to even be when I sit down at a VCR, turned into a CD player, turned into a Blu-ray player, turned into streaming on Netflix. It can follow me wherever I go. But I don't have a rule for that. So I, I guess I just, I don't know. On the other end of the spectrum, from the rule-following form of religion, is this space that is very popular. You proclaim the name of Jesus, and then every once in a while sing a song about him, possibly put on a good t-shirt that says something about your relationship with Jesus, and then just kind of do your best, and uh, that's fine. Be your general kind of spontaneous good self. Just let it ride. But is there something else? And in the midst of it, in comes the scripture regularly to kind of tangle with our minds. For instance, you remember this passage from Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, it says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Don't get confused, this is Jesus, the Jesus who came to save us, the one who by grace, through faith, a gift of God saves us, says, be perfect. Be perfect, and so we wouldn't be confused what level of perfect we're talking about. Be perfect like the Father is perfect. What? How you doing? How you feeling? What's your, what's your scorecard looking like? What's your grade report? Be perfect. Ah, I don't know where you find yourself. If you're at the polls, I find myself these days more and more in a third place altogether. And it helps me to listen a little bit to some of the metaphors that Jesus will use. So one of the first metaphors I think of, uh, of course, is this one about crops and growing. For Jesus will say, the kingdom of heaven is, is like a man who goes and plants. And so the seed has been sown, and you've said yes. But the next thing that happens is growth starts to emerge. And as you grow, we'll call it corn, because that seems like the metaphor there from Mark chapter 4. A stalk of corn, well, it doesn't just boom. It's a stalk of corn with an ear that you're plucking off and shucking and then putting into some boiling water. No, no, no. It starts in that moment some of you have done gardening with your children where you've planted seeds and you've watered the ground and you've waited and you've watched and then boop, up pops a little green sprig leaf of corn and it pushes up further and further. And if somebody were to ask you, wait, 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 is that corn yet? Yeah, absolutely corn. Perfect corn. It's right on time for what it ought to be. And then as the watering and the sunshine and the weather is right and it's the right kind of soil, it pushes up further and now it is a tiny stalk into a larger stalk and then those stalks begin to bud out with ears of corn and the ears grow large until finally, you see, all the way along it was absolutely corn. The deal is though, you can have growing, live, healthy corn or you can have dying corn. Right? Right? You're one or the other. You're not kind of, there's no, in be, there's no kind of other thing. You're growing or you're dying. What if, what if righteousness is about our growth inside our relationship of God, not to earn our relationship with God? What if it is a part of what natural living with Jesus is about, being, being purchased and in the kingdom of God? There's another metaphor Jesus uses in, in a number of places. Paul uses it as well. But you, you'll recall it from a nighttime discussion with a young man named Nicodemus recorded in John chapter 3 where Jesus is going to say this. You want to be a part of my kingdom? You must be born again. And of course, Nicodemus is going, well, I, don't, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. You must be born again. Now here's the thing about it. If we use this metaphor, you're born and you're a baby and infant, a toddler, a little child, an adolescent, a teenager, a young adult, and on, see, you don't stay in one spot. You grow, or else there's a big, big problem. So wherever you are, it's not always 
identifiable from the outside. Wherever you are, a little tiny sprig of green, a full stalk with budded ear, a baby, a teenager, we're in metaphors here, a seasoned adult, what God has in mind for us is growth. Now, fascinatingly, this, uh, this was a popular idea before Jesus came. In 380-ish, 384 B.C., young man becoming a, an adult, became a philosopher, a teacher, and we know his work a little bit, one of the Greek philosophers, Aristotle. Some 350 years before Jesus comes on the scene, he would suggest actually that the way we, are, we better ourselves and grow, it starts in our mind, in our brain. It starts with commitments. It starts with identifying things that we ought to be. And he taught very much that the highest level that you could be would be a ruler or maybe right below that a warrior, right? Just take the warrior for instance though. His suggestion was that it is just not so that a person is born with what a warrior needs in their virtues and character. A person would be born with less than warrior-like courage, would be born with less than fully strategic um, mindsets and so on. So in fact, what Aristotle suggested is that those who become rulers, those who become warriors, those who achieve the best, the most, that reach their full potential, do so because they've identified virtues and then in a thousand small little ways, they practice and practice because it's not necessarily natural to be that kind of courageous that in the midst of a battle, you would actually charge forward, that you would protect your troops. It's not natural that if we were sitting in this room together in a smaller circle and in wartime a grenade came bouncing into the middle of our circle, it's not the natural thing for us to act putting the other's safety above our own. These aren't natural tendencies. These are habits Aristotle suggested, that one would have to cultivate. He called some of them cardinal virtues. There were others, but courage, justice, prudence, temperance, that these are things you have to develop in yourself to have these virtues instead of vices. And over time, it's true, isn't it? You don't have to work to teach yourself a vice. All you have to do is coast, and you'll wander into vices. All you have to do is just not decide anything and you will end up getting locked in the grip of a vice. You have to choose a virtue and then you have to practice that virtue because this isn't our nature, these virtues, right? It's not our nature actually to be temperate, is it? Do you remember your children when they were young enough? In, in, uh, I remember my children. My daughter, my oldest daughter's favorite movie was The Sound of Music. And I will have to say, she would play that on an absolute loop. VCR days. No such thing as, you know, well, let's have a little dose here and then we'll save some for later. That's just no temperate. My son, for some amazing reason, I love this, he, he stumbled upon a little black and white, I believe, movie called Tora, 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 half of which is in Japanese with post, you know, with... The language being that he could not read, but he loved this movie. And sometimes he would get up before we would. We'd hear it in the living room, Tora, 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 airplanes flying over my son. And he would just play it, play it, play it, play it, play it. Did your child have a favorite food that they would eat every single meal if you let them? They would have died from malnutrition if you allowed it with neglecting other parts of their diet because that's what they liked and wanted. You see, we don't naturally come into this world with temperance. It isn't our nature. But if, Aristotle said, if you practice a thousand different ways, over time it can become second nature so that a warrior can be in the midst of even certain defeat and not shrink back. So that a ruler can do the unpopular thing 
because it is right. And along comes Jesus. Jesus, and of course, some of this is Paul telling us about Jesus that I want to share with you. And then, then for instance, there's this from Peter also. So we'll dabble in Jesus' teachings through the words and eyes of Peter and Paul here for a couple of minutes. Again, Aristotle taught that in fact the highest level would be to be a ruler or a warrior. And the best result, the goal, the end game from, from Aristotle's perspective is that you would be able to live in a place of appropriately earned pride because of having mastered these virtues. And in fact, talking about oneself, this was a big deal to share your accomplishments and so forth. And then along comes Jesus. And Jesus, uh, for instance, as compared to ruler and warrior, Jesus will actually say this. First Peter 2, 9, as Peter talks about this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And he's not talking about only certain ones. You are, in fact, it's, it's shifting the paradigm away from Aristotle's teaching. So Jesus would say, this isn't about only the elite, only the top. It's everyone, every single one. If you're in my kingdom, you're invited into my kingdom, and you say yes, now we're on a journey of royal priesthood. And that word royal, that has to do with this rulership peace. But for Jesus, the rulership is not to rule over. The, the rulership idea is that you are the conduit portraying the character of God to the people who don't know him. Taking God and translating it into skin so that others can see the character of God. That's what the ruler mode of the Christian is. And the priest, the priestly mode is when that person responds and they're ready to give worship, that you're able to direct them and their worship back to God. So you are standing between God and these lost individuals. You are helping God connect up and inviting others into his kingdom by displaying his character. This royal priesthood, and it's not just for the men. For Aristotle, it was just for the men. It's not just for the wealthy. For Aristotle, it was primarily the wealthy. It's not just for the older, more experienced. It could be anyone along the way. You are a royal priesthood, and you're called to this place of character. So yes, true moral morality in Christianity, it is not a part of our nature since sin, but choice and thought and practice and the grace of Jesus Christ, he can build in us a second and a new nature. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, says this. You may want to write that down so you can go back and check on it in a minute because it's an interesting metaphor that we usually use this metaphor to mean other things, but hang in there and follow. For in the first verse of 2 Corinthians 5, Paul will write, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an, e an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. What's he talking about? Well, some of us know this whole tent metaphor is sometimes used for the tabernacle of God here on earth. Some of us realize that in, uh, in Scripture, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'm going to build this dwelling for you, I'll come back. So we've got a couple options. Boom, immediately. Is this, is this heaven and God preparing a physical dwelling for us in heaven? Is this his dwelling here on earth, this tent? We read on. Verse 2, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Wow, the metaphor is getting a little different now. This is, we're going to be clothed in this heavenly dwelling, this place we will dwell for eternity. He goes on to say, because when we are clothed, in the third verse, we will not be found naked. Now this is starting to veer off from the, the tabernacle motif or the mansions in glory kind of motif. This is actually Paul saying this. We, right now, we are clothed in this earthliness and it is not our nature to have the character of God, but, but God is building for us a new character. And we long to be clothed with it. We want to put it on. It isn't that we're trying to earn 
our way into heaven. We are citizens of heaven and we would like to wear the garments of heaven. We'd like to have the character of God. It isn't that we're just saying, hey, I'm naked and God's going to save me and who cares? There's some third option in which we allow God to clothe us. And the fourth verse says, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Paul is saying this. I'm, I, what, I, I have what I have. I have this nature and it is, it is at war with itself because of sin. I long for the character of Christ. We talked about that a little bit last Sabbath. But I want to be putting on the clothing of Christ I want to put on his character. It's interesting. The world says, yeah, be yourself. Speak your truth. In fact, do whatever you need to to find yourself. Jesus says almost the exact opposite. If you want to be first, you'll be last. If you want to have life, you'll lay your life down. You'll deny yourself. You'll take up a cross and follow me. And then he says, in doing so, I will give you life and life to the fullest. It, the giving away of your life is you being the fullest version of humanity that you are meant to be. This world, and if you've, if you've tried it, you can try it in all sorts of different ways, just being yourself, succumbing to who you kind of are in your natural self. And you'll find that it's empty and that it doesn't feel like it's going to good places. Well, how about this? Have you journeyed with someone who's struggling with a life-threatening illness like many of us have? I had the privilege of walking beside my mother as she battled cancer for about a year and a half until she finally succumbed to it. I have pictures from that time and I treasure those pictures because she allowed me into a place of vulnerability that was really important to me. But as I look at those pictures, I'm also filled with this observation in those pictures, she is a shell of herself. She is a shadow of who I remember her to be as my mom. And in this world, in this kingdom, that's the way it works. In this kingdom, when you're 56 years of age, you look back on your better days because you used to be an athlete. You used to have hair. You used to be a different weight. You used to be able to run and not grow weary, right? And Jesus says there comes a time, coming a time when the youth will run and not grow weary. See, it's flipped. It's the exact opposite, where in this world, you become a shadow of yourself without Jesus Christ. With Jesus Christ, it flips around. You are a shadow of who you are going to be in him. What an amazing promise. If you fear growth because you're thinking of it as a checklist that you're going to get compared to, I encourage you to put that away. That isn't what Jesus has in mind for you. He is saying, I have a clothing for you that is brilliant, bold, and new. I have a version of you. It's what humanity was meant to be, and I want to grow you into that. And that will be life itself. That will be life abundant. That's the good life. So how do we do it? How does this happen? I want to just tell you, next week we're going to get more deeply into the how part of how do we wrestle? What are some things that we can do to, to kind of engage in the watering of the soil and the right nutrients? How do we, how, what do we do? But just first starter, just to whet your appetite, I want to, we, we talked about this a little bit before, but I'm going to dip back into a little verse from Romans, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, where Paul says it this way. He says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, becoming a shadow of yourself. Actually, remove the shadow, become who God is looking for you to be, and to do so, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want to just say to you, it starts in our mind. It starts with our consent. It starts with our dwelling on what Jesus has in store for us, where he is growing us to. There's a famous leadership notion, start with the end in mind. 
if you want to get somewhere important. And Paul is saying, start by the transforming of your mind, by engaging in new commitments. Romans chapter 5 points out something I think that's fantastic. Because what we're really getting into is not rule keeping, we're getting into character growth. A change from the inside out, these virtues that, that are a part of the character of Jesus Christ. And Paul writes in Romans 5, for we also rejoice in our sufferings. Why? That's nonsense, that's craziness that you would rejoice in suffering, but he's on to something here because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And Jesus is saying, look, if you want to have hope in this world, no matter what is going on, let me grow your character. You want the peace that passes understanding? Let me grow your character. You want to be able to uh, have a great day anytime you get to interact with any human being? Let me get at the growth of your ability to love even the unlovely. Patience, endurance, you know where I'm at. This is Galatians chapter 5, right? I invite you to turn there to this little section, the fruits of the Spirit. We've sung them in songs, we've played it in games, but I'm just read it. These fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit, verse 22, chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I, I challenge you, think about having a neighbor who this typifies. That's a good neighborhood. Consider that this is how you would describe your spouse, your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad. That this is the work environment in which you live. Way beyond that, imagine those were the typical ingredients of the garden of your life. That you were filled with joy even when others can't seem to find it. That you have peace even amidst distance and pandemics that you have love. Jesus is teaching us the language of heaven. And he's not requiring us to know the language to get in, but as soon as we say yes, he begins the growth process in us. And it starts with us acknowledging, this is what God has in mind for me. I want it. I want in. I don't know how this is all going to work. I'm not sure I'm going to be great at it immediately. It's not my nature, but maybe it can become my second nature through the miraculous growth process of God. Could it be? That's his plan for my life. I don't know any of you that have traveled to a foreign country and spent a year abroad somewhere. A lot of our students do this sort of thing, whether in South America or Europe or all sorts of places. I had a young friend of mine who uh, was going to be spending a year in Italy, and do you know what he did as he prepared? What do you, what do you suppose he did? He really started working crunching on learning his Italian. Now he had some advantages compared to some of the rest of us because he's not only fluent in English but also fluent in Spanish and so he was taking his Spanish and doubling up and twisting and moving it a little bit in his understanding through the Latin roots of Italian but he had a lot of work to do but of course he's going to live there for a year. He wants to know the language so that he can participate in everything so that he can interact with all of it so that he can be more of a citizen there. And wouldn't you know it, Jesus, in giving us eternal life, begins to help teach us the language of heaven. And if you've got any confusion, you need to boil it down even simpler than that. You can go to a little chapter written by Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that you know well. Summarized by this little statement, and the greatest of these is love. John will write in 1 John, God is love. If you don't have love, you don't know who God is. God is teaching you all these virtues. And by the way, these aren't the same virtues that Aristotle taught. Aristotle didn't teach that patience is a virtue. He didn't teach that humility is a virtue. He didn't teach that charity is a virtue. These came from Christ because he flipped self-servants on its head. And here he is, the greatest of these. You want the core key 
for speaking the language of heaven, it's the language of love. And you'd be right, right about now to say, hmm, I'm not sure I'm good at these things. Does that mean I'm out? And Jesus would say, it's because you're in that I'm so anxious to work on these with you. Let God renew your mind. Let God lock you in on these virtues that he's anxious to build up in you. And by the way, if you master love as a principle, then you can have all kinds of changing circumstances and you, and you have a way to communicate. You have a, a virtue to deploy in imitating this God of ours. But I understand it, that it is a little bit intimidating to read a list like you know, that includes perseverance and self-control and a little bit intimidating because you can find where you don't match up, but that's not God's purpose here. He is saying, here's the map of my character that I'm gonna grow in you and I'm looking for you to explore and experiment in a thousand little ways so that as the days roll by, you become fluent in my language. And if you have any question whether you're being judged way too harshly on this, which sometimes we have turned ourselves into this judgment machinery of religiosity, I just want to invite you to take that little book, Steps to Christ, and flip through to page 64 where you'll find this incredible passage on growth in the midst of our challenges and our nature not matching the nature of Christ. But she'll write this. Follow along with me. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be the children of God, and yet... They realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty, and they're ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit at all. Sound any kind of familiar to your life? Stumbling and tripping and falling? We're not even going to bring up whether it's something we've tripped and fallen on recently already or a few days in a row. But she goes on and says, to such I would say this. Do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes, but we are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken, and rejected of God. This idea of bearing fruit some of us think fruit trees just bear fruit and that's because obviously it comes naturally to fruit trees, but ah, Great fruit trees need the gardener to prune, to train, to cultivate, to help them rid of blight or to protect from caterpillars or it's a great metaphor. God wants to tend the garden of our life and he celebrates us growing all along the way. I don't know, I asked this out in the park. I don't know if anybody here has a friend named Chesley. Do you have a friend, anybody know somebody named Chesley? Know a Chesley? Actually, Tim Trott raised his hand and then looked around at his family or maybe his brother who was there sitting near him, a couple of his brothers, and seemed to be wondering why they weren't raising their hands because he had a friend in college named Chesley. I don't know too many Chesleys. Save this one. Chesley was a bright young man in high school. He was an honors student. He was uh, actually admitted into Mensa. I mean, okay, calm down, young Chesley. Uh, he was a part of the Latin club, which I'm sure made him popular with the ladies, and uh, was the first chair flautist in the band. He graduates, he goes on to the Air Force Academy because he had had experiences in airplanes and it made him deeply want to fly, and he excelled. Along with the other flight training they were going through and other education there, the Air Force, that portion that he was involved with, had a glider program during that period of time, and he mastered the glider program. In fact, by the time he graduated from the Air Force Academy, he was not just a glider pilot, he was one of the glider trainers for other students. Graduated with the designation Top Flyer from the Air Force 
Academy. He moves on into the Air Force where he masters uh, certifications and flight hours on all sorts of different aircrafts. He becomes a trainer, a commander. He's got a knack for this, and he now has a lot of experience that can only be acquired in the military so that as he emerges from the military, U.S. Airways wants to hire him. So in 1980, he begins flying their large aircraft, multi-engine aircraft for U.S. Airways. 1980 through 2010, Chesley is a pilot for U.S. Airways. Years and years of experience. And then, one January day, Chesley is taking a flight, 3.15 in the afternoon in January, a flight that's supposed to go from LaGuardia Airport in New York City to Charlotte, North Carolina, and as the plane climbs up and gets to a uh, low altitude, but it's off the ground and doing fine, and control is turned over to the co-pilot, who's brand new. This U.S. Airways Flight 1549 flies through a flock of geese. Some of you know it. You might not remember Chesley. I'm not sure if only his mom called him Chesley. Very early in his life, they began calling him Sully, Captain Sullenberger. Well, Chesley, <laughs> Sully, takes over controls as two geese f go straight through their engines and knock them out, they're vaporized, and amazingly, the engines didn't explode, but now the airplane is dead quiet, eerie. It's 208 seconds between when those geese hit those engines and when that plane gets all the way back to Earth. In those 208 seconds, there are transcript recordings, tower checking in, how are you? Sullenberger coming on saying, we have both engines out, we have no power. They clear the runways back at LaGuardia and also offer Teterboro in New Jersey as a possible landing spot, but Sully is gonna say, we're not gonna make it to either one, I'll be in the Hudson. And the voice comes back, say what? Pardon me, come again, repeat. In that 208 seconds, Sullenberger does all sorts of calculations. He's going to have to navigate threading a needle, getting out of the Bronx so he won't end up crashing into largely populated areas. He's got to make sure he is elevated enough to get over one of the bridges to find a spot to land on the Hudson River. And then he's gonna use all that experience from flying and glider piloting and everything that has happened in his past. And he's gonna set this plane down remarkably against all odds into the Hudson River where 155 passengers and crew will climb out onto the wings and be saved because of his 208 seconds. Afterwards, sometime later, Sully would be quoted to say, one way of looking at it, it could be like this, that for 42 years I've been making small regular deposits in this bank of experience, education, and training, and on January 15 of 2009, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. A thousand, a hundred thousand, a million moments practiced because first they were chosen and then they were acted upon and then the experience grows. See, a warrior doesn't wander onto the battlefield with courage day one. It takes years of embracing courage. The Christian doesn't start out just this amazingly humble person. It is an act of choice practiced in the face of opportunity to lose your humility. Charity in the face of need on your own part. Patience when things uh, everybody around you is acting impetuously. Kindness when you're spoken ill of. 
These are the languages of heaven, and Jesus is not saying, look, I'm going to give you a test, and if you can't pass it, you're lost. No, he's saying, you are found. Now I'm going to train you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to grow you up in my vernacular of love, and so we grow in him. I hope wherever you are, Whichever metaphor you want, if you're a brand new baby in Jesus Christ, if you are a person who has walked the walk with Jesus and you are kind of a senior citizen, even if you're in the middle of your life because of your journey with Jesus so that you are secure, you are so well developed, wherever you are, I hope today you choose, I choose growth in him. Father, I want to lock in on your language. And it's not natural to me. But I want to grow through a thousand little choices. Father, thank you, thank you that this growth is not some weird religious quiz you're hoping to stump us with trick questions so that you can say, ha ha, I told you you were saved, but you're not good enough. Thank you, thank you that you love me right here, right now, even in the places that I struggle to grow, but that you're not leaving me here, that it is your grace that brings growth, that it is your reign of the Holy Spirit that brings growth, that it is the food of your word that brings growth. And at every turn, you keep checking with us and checking with us. Do you want to grow today? What's your choice today? Do you want to grow today? And Lord, we want to say it. We want your help, your encouragement, your security, because we are yours. Lord God, help us match who you are teach us your language, even give us your accent. Would you grow us in you? In the name of Jesus Christ, we claim it, we pray for it, we will experiment with it a thousand little ways this week. In Jesus, amen. And a happy Sabbath to you.